When we think of common questions that our team and all technical sellers at Microsoft get asked, for sure in the top 10 in the network space is, does my traffic stay on the Microsoft global wide area network when flown from point A to B, or does it use the public internet? Well, the good news is it's an easy answer, and the short answer is yes, and the long answer is yes. And this video is going to unpack the, the sort of why, some examples of traffic flow, why you might be interested, why would a company care if it used the internet or not. We'll talk a little bit about encryption, and then we'll give a nod to other content related to when users come into the Microsoft network and uh, how much of the Microsoft network you might use in that scenario. So let's zoom into a example global customer. You know, many enterprises that build on top of Azure put blocks of infrastructure and service usage in America, in EMEA, in APAC. And that gives us a great framework for addressing this question of, does my traffic stay on the Microsoft network? And in my diagram here, I've got a customer that's got virtual network based things like virtual machines, containers, VNet injected path services, private endpoints, etc. And they've deployed that into a region A in America, region B in Europe, region C in Asia Pacific. And then also this customer has got some path services being used in the US. So that's things like Azure storage, which is not using a private endpoint. Um, any other PaaS service basically that's using a public IP. We have the same thing in Europe. And then to bring home the idea that all traffic stays on the Microsoft network, we're going to assume this customer's got their Microsoft 365 tenant data hosted inside of some Microsoft data centers somewhere in the Asia region. So let's zoom in on America. Let's say the, they've got a virtual network here in America in one of the US regions. And even if this is spread across different availability zones, for sure we can say that all region traffic there, AZ1 to AZ2, that's definitely stayed on the Microsoft network. When things inside of America, inside of a virtual network, try and access things inside of the same region but on a public IP, that traffic stays on the Microsoft network. Now let's consider some more global scenarios. Let's say this virtual network is peered via global VNet peering to a VNet in a region in Europe. Global VNet peering, does that always use the Microsoft network? Yes, so this, this region here is connected to the Microsoft global network. The global VNet peering is just an overlay on top of the same global network. So yes, that traffic stays on the Microsoft network. Similarly, all of the PaaS services are inside of Azure data centers that are connected to the Microsoft global network. So if you had a VNet in the US talking to, for example, public storage endpoint in EMEA, that traffic would go over the Microsoft global network. Same thing, of course, going to Asia, if there was some global VNet here in here as well. You start to see a pattern here. The answer is always yes. But again, just to bring that point home, what if I had, for example, a VDI farm here inside of a VNet in the US, it was using a NAT gateway perhaps to go out to the, to the internet? Well, we have to be careful about the use of the word internet there, right? Because if that destination it's going to is a Microsoft public IP, in this case, my M365 tenant inside of Asia, well, this is connected to the Microsoft global network. So is the data center that hosts my M365 data. So this traffic from my VDI farm, my M365 tenant also stays on the Microsoft global network. You can see for every single scenario here, whether it be Office 365, Dynamics, Power Platform, even things like Xbox, if you had some strange scenario where you've got a VNet reaching out, out to an Xbox endpoint, this all stays on the Microsoft network. There's no use of public internet here. You then might say, well, that's great. Thanks for telling me that. Is there a public reference I can use? The good news is yes. We have a couple of pages where this is documented. And you'll find this information in documents that talk about the Microsoft global network as a whole. 
we could run an entire session on the, on the Microsoft Global Network and talk about how it's the thing that's used to connect all of our Azure regions together. One of the top two or three largest networks in the world. It's used for everything from Bing to Xbox to Office 365. And inside of this uh, page here, uh, linked to a, a pretty graphic down there, you'll see here, IP traffic stays entirely within our global network and never enters the public internet. So there's reference point one. I'll drop the link in the description. Again, here's another page about the Microsoft Global Network. And if we search for public internet, again, so does the all traffic using Microsoft services stay on the network? Yes, any traffic between data centers within Azure, Microsoft services such as VMs, M365, Xbox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera routes within our global network and never over the public internet. And then it starts to talk about reasons why a customer might care about this. So let's talk a little bit about that. If we weren't using our network that we built out and acquired cables for and connected routers together, etc., how would we connect from point A to point B across the globe? How do most of the companies that don't have the privilege of having their own network route between those large distances and the answer is simply you revert back to the network that exists uh, that's been built out between those endpoints and that's the thing of course that we call the internet where we have all these various carriers meshed together and they have agreements to pass traffic there's a sort of layering hierarchy of carriers that do that so if you were to imagine we were routing traffic from EMEA to APAC and we couldn't use the Microsoft network, what you might find is you pass your traffic to a service provider in EMEA who has to route it to Asia. Maybe they hand it off to a middle ISP here and that ISP might be the same one or different depending on day of the month or traffic flows or fiber breaks or um, different variables in the region. Maybe they hand it off to a different carrier and then finally it gets to your destination. Uh, again, why would we um, be concerned about that or why would we want to use a more native single vendor approach? Well, I've broken it down into three of the most important variables here. It's not an exhaustive list, but it gives us some good talking points. And um, you know, one is security. Now, for sure, most customers, when they send data between these endpoints, it will have application level encryption, you know, sort of certificate based TLS, etc. But for that security in depth approach, there are some customers that want it and some customers that are regulated to have it, have a more defense in depth approach. And if you imagine you've got these carriers that hand off traffic to each other, when you scrape below the surface, you realize it's happening in rooms like this. And the sort of quality and security of these rooms will vary uh, based on carrier, based on location. And the main concern here would be some sort of man in the middle attack. So if this facility was compromised, somebody could plug a laptop in and you know, with the right information about tracking down source and destination, it's feasible to imagine being able to sniff packets. Uh, in reality, it would be very hard to do, but that will be the concern there. And if you know it's happening on the Microsoft network and we've put the controls in place to hand off traffic from tables that we've acquired, the vendors that we've worked with, the locations where we've decided to put our routers, there's obviously a greater degree of assurance for the security of that traffic. And we'll talk a little bit about encryption in a second because that's also an important point and quite related. You also have to think about performance. If you end up using an internet based path, then you are at the mercy of how the internet is being routed at, at that particular point in time. So you might hand off to a carrier in Europe and who's to say they're going to end up routing the traffic using the best possible path for latency across the world. Um, the internet generally works based on metrics not just about performance, it could involve cost and reliability and what paths are available at that point in time and there's no assurances there. Uh, so at Microsoft, we want to be in control of our own destiny. So we've acquired the links. 
And if we want to get from point A to point B, we now data centers. Obviously, it's in our interest to make sure that we have got the best, most performant paths available in terms of latency. And you can go and check out some external reports from companies like Thousand Eyes that certainly validate uh, that, um, that assertion. And also, it's not just about uh, performance, it's about reliability. So you might have good latency on a Monday morning. Uh, what about on Black Friday? What about on Christmas Day? What about when there's an explosion in capacity? What about during COVID, et cetera, et cetera? So because we run our own network, we get to control uh, the bandwidth and how many paths are available. And again, it's in Microsoft's interest to make sure that the reliability metrics in terms of jitter, packet loss, uh, the number of paths available based on regional geographical dependencies, they all make sense for the traffic. Whereas with the internet, you're much more susceptible to you know, paths failing over. Uh, and generally speaking, those reports that I referred to before, like the Thousand Eyes reports, will back up the fact that you, you get better performance in terms of uh, jitter and packet loss on the Microsoft network as opposed to using the, the internet. But let's just pick up on that encryption point because this is another uh, interesting point which is quite often packaged in the same question from customers when, when we say, do we use the Microsoft network to get between these green, blue, and red endpoints? We might also want to ask, well, you know, yes, I'm encrypting my data at the application level, but what about encryption in transit at the network level? And this is where we can start looking at some documentation around encryption of data in transit. So if you work in networking, you're probably familiar with the concept of uh, MACSEC encryption. So if you have a, a link between two routers, if those routers at either end are configured in a certain way, they can encrypt traffic uh, transparently uh, at layer two and all information that runs on top of that will be uh, have that assurance provided by that. And uh, we call that out here. Whenever Azure customer traffic moves between data centers outside of physical boundaries not controlled by Microsoft, so for example, if we send traffic from one data center in an Azure region in the US to an Azure data center in Europe, and in the middle there, we're using a cable that we're leasing from carrier X, then that traffic will be MACSEC encrypted. You might have your, your certificate-based encryption at the application level, and then you have wire-level encryption provided by the, the Microsoft routers at either end of that uh, physical or logical cable. So you have that sort of defense in depth or double encryption. And uh, as it says here, this is on by default. You can't turn it off. It applies to all Azure traffic within a region or between regions. Uh, when it leaves the Microsoft control facility. So that's another part of the, the question in terms of the Microsoft global network and definitely one to have in your back pocket of knowledge when designing these uh, global network topologies. The last thing I wanted to mention here is, well, you get into a similar uh, conversation area here when you start to add users into this picture. So what if I had a user down here that's in the green category. It's a user in Singapore, for example, coming into the Microsoft network, you know, let's say just via normal internet access, and it's trying to hit a public IP of something hosted here in the US. Uh, and ultimately here, the, the key takeaway would be the Microsoft network is configured by default to take in that traffic as soon as possible. So we want to take in that traffic from the Singapore user Probably in Singapore, if they're using a uh, sort of local, well-connected ISP, and then route that traffic across our network. Uh, this is an entire area in itself, which is worth exploring if you're researching these things. And probably the best resource uh, to go and get a deep dive on that would be this routing preference video by John Savile. So there's a there's a toggle in Azure where you can change public IPs from the default, which is what I just described about taking in traffic near the user. Uh, that's called cold potato routing informally in, in the network industry. Uh, you can flip that toggle to, to have 
hot potato route in, which would be Microsoft sort of takes that traffic in nearer the destination that you're targeting. But go and check out this video from John. Uh, he does a great video of explaining it. And as you can see, he goes into the detail of having these global topologies and pops and internet, etc., etc. Anyway, I hope you find that useful. Uh, the key takeaway is when we get asked this question, often by security folks, does my traffic stay on the Microsoft network? The answer is a resounding yes.